Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Prostate Forum of Orange County. And our presentation for this evening is Achieving Happiness After Prostate Cancer. It is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Catherine Kloss, MD, an esteemed specialist in sexual health and intimacy, who has over 20 years of experience in urology and sexual medicine, with a particular focus on helping individuals navigate the challenges of sexual health after cancer treatment. And I'm going to ask you, is that all kinds of cancer treatments? I don't think, are we just talking about prostate cancer We're here? just talking about prostate cancer today. Okay. Generally speaking, uh, other kinds of cancers? We could, we could also include bladder cancer in some of this as surgery and radiation can affect a similar aspect of uh, sexual health in men. So you could lump those two together. You could also probably lump in rectal, colorectal cancer as well. But my ob obviously my, my focus and expertise is in the area of urology. Excellent. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, dealing with the special challenges faced by prostate cancer patients, including erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, and emotional impacts on inner intimacy. She will provide valuable insights and practical advice to help you and your partner maintain a fulfilling and intimate relationship. Uh, as we said, Dr. Dr. Kloss is board certified urologist, has graduated University of Notre Dame and attended medical school Joined the meeting. of Alabama uh, in Birmingham. She completed her urology residency at George Washington University and subsequently began practicing in the, in, in the district served by George Washington University. First, a quick word about the Prostate Forum. The Prostate Forum has been active for more than 30 years, offering information, education, and hope to anyone affected by prostate cancer. We host online support groups twice a month on the second and fourth Tuesday these sessions provide a safe place to share experiences and support each other. To stay informed about upcoming meetings, simply register on our website, prostateforum.org. On the fourth Tuesday of most months, we offer special presentations just like this one, featuring leading experts in prostate cancer. These sessions provide valuable insights and the latest information on treatments and research, helping you stay informed and empowered. You can find almost 100 previous presentations on the website at prostateforum.org slash presentations. And if you subscribe to this YouTube channel, you'll be notified when new presentations are released. Finally, remember you can make a difference. The Prostate Forum is an all volunteer organization, so we always can use your help to help others. Consider volunteering your time or making a donation to support our work. Your time and expertise can be used to organize support for outreach, for content creation, and for website maintenance. And your donations help us continue to provide these vital resources and support services. Visit our website to learn more about how you can get involved, make a donation, and have a positive impact. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and I uh, appreciate you all giving me the time to speak to you. I am going to focus tonight on erections and post prostatectomy erections. I will start by, like I said, hopefully not completely boring you in um, what I would like to say the basis of erections. I, I, my One of my passions is education. And I feel like if we can understand the basics of, not even the basics, the more detailed of how things work, it, it makes you understand what are the effects? What are the effects of treatment? And then what am I able to do to potentially circumvent or you know, augment my sexual life after something like prostate cancer? So with that, I also say I'm excellent at my job. I'm not great at technology or PowerPoint. So bear with me if I get this going, okay? Thank you. Going then. Okay, so basics about erections. Erections are more than just a hard penis, okay? You've got components that I will speak on tonight, all of these aspects, hormonal, neural, vascular, and psychological. You really want to break it down into those areas. Now, before we get started, all right, Kevin Bacon. Okay, so why Kevin Bacon? 
six degrees of separation. So during this talk, I'm going to share a little bit about myself and hopefully you can connect. I once was told the best way to reach an audience, no matter what you're talking about, is to have them be able to relate to you. So as a 44-year-old woman who lives in Washington, D.C., I really need you guys to hone in on what these things are. I obviously am not in the average age range for prostate cancer, nor have I had prostate cancer. Heck, I don't even have a penis, all right? I do have corporal tissue. But, so I throw this in here, see what you can catch on to, and you'll learn a little bit about me as we also learn about our um, post-prostatectomy erection. So I'm from the Midwest. I won't spend too much time on this um, outside of Chicago. I am a parent. I have three kids, as I've already alluded to, dear God. Brown hair. I wear glasses or a contacts. I am a huge Cubs fan and I don't know what the other one was, but we'll have to wait to see till the next slide. So we'll start with that. Prevalence of erectile dysfunction. So in the United States, the main study that we quote, the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, um, looked at men between um, 40 and 70 years old with the average reported rate of erectile dysfunction just over 50%. All right. I say that these are not men with prostate cancer. This is to help you realize that you are, you know, post-prostatectomy, you are not alone. There are a majority of men that have issues with erectile function in absence of prostate cancer or prostate cancer treatment. Um, global statistics range a little bit differently and are geographically based, but um, on average about 30% in most European studies. So what are your risk factors? Again, general risk factors. It's been clearly established erectile dysfunction is associated with high blood pressure, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Um, again, about 40% of men with high blood pressure will also have erectile dysfunction. In diabetics, it's over 50%. And there's a 3.5 times increased risk of erectile dysfunction in men with diabetes. That's huge. Again, hyperlipidemia, BPH, so urinary symptoms also. These men have upwards of 70% associated uh, erectile dysfunction. And then we also have behavioral factors. So smoking, you know, alcohol use, physical activity, or lack thereof that can contribute to erectile function. Now, this is where I tend to get into the weeds, but I want you to really feel like you understand what contributes to getting an erection. All right. So we start at the penis. Really important to understand anatomy. The penis is essentially composed of three cylinders. I kind of do it like this. Um, the bottom cylinder where the urine comes out and then the other two cylinders are your corporal bodies or your erectile tissue. So you've got erectile tissue here with, we'll talk about this in some more detail, the main vascular artery or cavernosal artery going through both sides, your urethra down here, and then some of our other um, important structures, your veins and arteries, uh, more superficial to the corporal bodies. Just another picture over here. Within these corporal bodies, again, I'll speak about this a lot, is a network of smooth muscle with, within vasculature. So a vein or an artery has smooth muscle within it. And that smooth muscle is very important in helping us get and maintain an erection. And we'll talk about the changes that occur there that can lead or contribute to erectile dysfunction. So a little bit more about the you know neuroanatomy of erection. So we've got this anatomical picture of the penis, urethra, glands or head of the penis, and then these corporal bodies. Now, erections are really a reflex, all right? So they're a spinal reflex. Um, they're triggered either by tactile or manual stimulation, all right? They also can be triggered by mental arousal. The main player in stimulation is this dorsal nerve of the penis, okay? So I've got it highlighted over here. Um, this is the one that carries the, what we call uh, sensory input to your spinal cord, all right? You've got this S2 through four is one of the main areas and then carries it back to initiate the erection, okay? So again, while there are a lot of components and the vascular or blood supply is necessary to get an erection, you've got to have this reflexive nerve component of things. So we'll get a little bit more into that, but uh, let me get down here. Okay. So again, interplay of nerves is very important. And I stress this because when we get to the point of talking about prostate cancer and treatments for prostate cancer, 
these areas are affected. So just to take a quick overview, this is a side view as if we kind of cut you down the middle, all right? So your pubic bone that you can feel if you press down on your lower pelvis is here. This is the bladder. This is the prostate here that sits below the bladder with the seminal vesicles extending posteriorly and your vas deferens, which eventually lands into your scrotum, all right? This nerve network that is associated with um, initiating erection, it lies all you know in this area towards the posterior portion of the sacrum, um, the, the uh, anterior portion of the penis, and then around the prostate, okay? So even though the prostate, its main function is to produce fluid for ejaculate by virtue of location. One of my friends is a great realtor, location, location, location. It becomes intimately involved in erectile function. So again, innervation is important. Um, there are several different mechanisms to it. You really are focusing on this area of S2 um, through four, which is your uh, sacral portion of your spinal cord. These nerve cells, now this is important again, are mediated by nitric oxide. So we'll get to this later on, but there's a contraindication for some treatments due to taking an additional nitric oxide. And this is one of the reasons why. So while this seems like complete minutia, it does come into play when we are talking about, you know, your run of the mill treatment of erectile dysfunction. Um, other areas of the spinal cord are also involved. And then this hypogastric plexus along the pelvic side wall helps to mediate portions of the um, reflux arc of erections. Also very important when you talk about prostate cancer surgery, where there's a lymph node dissection typically done along the pelvic side wall, or in a more potentially in a radiation field where you will have effects of radiation along that side wall as well. So I bring that into light. Um, um, there's additional component, motor component um, of the pudendal nerve that comes into play via erections. And again, this is, um, I will, like I said, I promise I'll try to minimize the minutia here. So what are our important nerves? This wonderful cavernosal nerve, it, it lies just, you know, posterior to the prostate. So again, our prostate is super important um, in in being associated with structures for erection. And then that cavernosal nerve runs along the anterior portion of the penis and helps initiate this dilation, which we'll talk about a bit more, of the blood vessels within the corporal bodies and subsequently, um, you know, cause an erection. So fundamental, even though I'm part, you know, harping on these, this nerve component, the fundamental, again, unifying factor is that you've got to have increased blood flow to the penis for an erection, and you have to have sustained blood flow there, all right? So this is a depiction of a cross-section of the penis in the flaccid state, and this is a depiction in the erect state. Now, in the flaccid state, you actually have contraction of the smooth muscles within these corporal bodies, which helps limit the blood flow, all right? That's in the relaxed state. Ooh, I'm sorry. And then in, in the erect state, you need to have relaxation of those smooth muscle fibers to cause blood flow into the penis. And then we'll talk about how that um, results in you know, maintaining that blood within the penis, because that's really the secondary portion of um, importance. It's what we call veno occlusion. All right. So with dilation of these, what we call subtunica vessels, so you get the artery that, that dilates. And when the arteries are able to expand to their maximum, so you've got to have good pliability of those arteries, those two arteries join together and they're able to block off the blood from leaving the penis. So we're able to dilate to get the blood in to the penis and then that dilation because the two, two arteries will come so close together, will prohibit blood from leaving the penis, all right? Um, when we have something called venous leak, it's when the arteries dilate, but not so much so that the veins close off and you can get blood that still leaves the penis. That's the term what we refer to as venous leak. So you'll hear that frequently in any just depiction of erectile dysfunction, whether it's related to a prostate cancer treatment or in absence of that. 
vascular anatomy is important. Again, I, I highlight this because it's involved in location close to the prostate and can be impacted by prostate cancer surgery or radiation to the prostate, both of which are you know, first line therapies for prostate cancer treatment. Our main arteries are off this internal pudendal here, um, dorsal artery of the penis, cavernosal artery, um, and bulbal urethral artery, which supplies blood to the glands of the penis and portions of the urethra. All right, so fancy depiction of the venous drainage of the penis, okay? Again, this is important because you're talking about this vascular leak. You have an excellent, you know, um, efferent flow, so blood leaving the penis as well. All of this coalesces around our lovely prostate gland, okay? Now, the pelvic floor musculature, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. This, you're saying, well, how, is skeletal, how are skeletal muscles important in erections? We know that skeletal, these skeletal muscles, are specifically your bulbal cavernosus and your ischial cavernosus muscles, are important for ejaculation. Those are the ones that cause, you know, have significant contraction and cause ejaculation. But they also contribute to erection. How is that? Well, through reflux, oh, through re reflux as well, these two muscles here at the base of the penis, okay, um, will force more blood into the penis. So this is one of the components when you're thinking about, well, you know, you see a urologist like myself who specializes in sexual health, and I ask you all of these detailed questions about your erections, you know, in terms of rigidity, how long it's lasting. In my mind, I'm cataloging all of the different areas that may be affected. And the skeletal musculature is one of those. You know, you can get an erection that's, you know, potentially 80% as rigid as it was 10 years ago. And one of the components to that lack of rigidity can be changes in the skeletal muscles of the pelvic floor, all right? Um, and again, this is what usually these contraction here, not only... Um, assist in ejaculation or expulsion of the ejaculate, but also in increased rigidity. So I go there. So those are the, the broader components. So we've got nerves, muscles, um, vascular component, and we'll talk about the hormonal co component later. But um, we also have molecular mediators. Now I only highlighted one. There are several molecular mediators. But nitric oxide is a predominant mediator in erectile, um, in uh, in erections. Sorry, long long there. It is seen in all of these different places. So it's not one one location that we find nitric oxide. It's in neuro, neurons. It's in endothelium, which is a smooth muscle of uh, blood blood vessels. Um, you get it in response to st stimulation and. Its production is altered as we get older in patients with diabetes, which is why you see over 50% of diabetics, you know, even if they don't have neuropathy as, you know, having associated erectile dysfunction and can be affected in conditions like sickle cell, which um, have their own component of erectile dysfunction um, that is, uh, happens much earlier on. So what does nitric oxide do? And we'll see this slide again when we look at treatment pathways, because most of you likely know that our lovely Cialis, Viagra, Tadalafil, or sorry, um, uh, Stendra and Levitra all impact um, the cell uh, just distal to nitric oxide. So nitric oxide from let's call it a nerve ending, it stimulates what we call this um, guaiolate cyclase and turns GTP into CGMP, all right? This leads um, to smooth muscle relaxation, which we said is necessary to cause dilation and entrance of blood into the penis, all right? And again, this is kind of a preview, sorry, preview of where our sildenafil comes in, but I'll show you this slide again. But this is what it does on the cellular level, all right? Cellular level, it works via GTP to CGMP and allows for arterial smooth muscle relaxation. So, which again, leads to increased arterial flow and erection. All right, I'll breathe for a second. Other things about myself that, again, some of you are gonna grab onto. I was an anthropology major in college. I love chocolate. I literally probably eat it three times a day. Chocolate chip cookies are my total demise. I love coffee. Um, I drink black coffee. I judge people who add cream and sugar to their coffee. Uh, Trader Joe's flowers really get me through the week because they're probably $6.99 and 
they really they really can make you smile um I don't like to admit this but I did hitchhike in, in college which is god help me that I survived that and in I hope none of you can relate to this um my children for the first time recently had lights so that was an experience I would much prefer to forget um so breathe um and we'll move on Ooh, I I missed an extra one so Back to general erectile dysfunction, okay? And this pie chart is nice to encapsulate the different components that can be causative for erectile dysfunction. We are going to talk again a little more specifically about pelvic surgery and radiation, which really only encompasses 6% of um, etiologies of erectile dysfunction. Neurologic disease, endocrinopathy, vascular disease obviously is a large one. Um, diabetes and medication, okay, all can contribute to different, um, uh, excuse me, all different etiologies that contribute to erectile dysfunction. Now, to really hit home the independent risk factors for ED, all right, meaning it, it sucks to be dealing with prostate cancer and treatments for prostate cancer and, you know, the, the outcomes and side effects. There are, you know, 94% of men who all, you know, don't have that component and are still dealing with erectile dysfunction because of multiple risk factors. Again, age, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arterial disease, peripheral vascular disease, obesity, spinal cord injury, lots of medications, um, especially your uh, hypertensive medications neuromuscular conditions, um, neurodegenerative disease, renal insufficiency, and then again, prostate cancer and prostate cancer treatment. So the most common cause of erectile dysfunction is this venous leak, which, we spoke, which I spoke about previously, where you have, in this scenario, you get excellent dilation of the arterioles inside the cavernosal tissue of the penis. This is our main cavernosal artery, but you get this dilation. And with that, this dilation, you can see the pressure and the you know, decrease in diameter or size of the veins that would normally take the blood away from the penis. Um, this is in the flaccid state, but this is akin to what can happen with a venous lake. You get some dilation of these uh, arterial corporal bodies, but you get persistence of the diameter in the veins of the penis, which will cause you know, yes, the blood is getting there, but it's also rushing out and leaving. So the main um, cause of erectile dysfunction is typically venous leak. Okay, so take a break from that for a second, and we're going to delve into prostate cancer, things that I'm sure you all know. Second most common cancer behind skin cancer. Uh, 2021 data, you know, shows that there's almost, you know, uh, 250,000 new cases of prostate cancer a year, We're talking one in seven to one in eight men, depending on what uh, data that you quote, will be diagnosed with prostate cancer and the average age is 66. So again, basic facts about prostate cancer. Treatment options. So this is nice to highlight. There are new, you know, the treatment options have changed from when I started 20 years ago to where we are now. And a lot of that is better for patients' quality of life, which, you know, highlights active surveillance and watchful waiting. But you're talking about 150,000 men per year who are having some form of treatment for prostate cancer, whether that's radiation, which is a slightly smaller number, or surgical prostatectomy, almost 100,000 men per year. When we talk about androgen deprivation, immunotherapy or chemotherapy, you're really talking about more advanced disease states. So we're going to limit that. Now, probability of recovery of erectile function, excuse me, after prostate cancer treatment really correlates to preoperative erectile function. So if someone, you know, walks into my office, I, I do not do prostate cancer surgery anymore. I used to back in the day. And they said to me, you know, I'm, I'm using... Viagra to get an erection. And when I do, my erections are only about 75% um, as rigid as they were five years ago. Well, unfortunately, prostate cancer treatment, whether it's surgery or radiation, is not going to improve your erections. It's typically only going to cause some additional decline. So it's really important for patient expectation and, and honest conversation to know what a patient's erectile function is prior to treatment. 
are two um, most reliable forms of assessing erectile function um, are these validated questionnaires. And this is where most of our research is based. So it's very important to assess preoperative erectile function to give a patient the most accurate expectation. And we'll talk about that again when we look at reported um, outcomes of erectile function post prostate cancer treatment. Now, radiation. So we'll talk about this one real quickly. So what does radiation do to, um, do to erections? So you get reduction in smooth muscle content, you get um, inflammation, you know, in, uh, in the, um, in your CNS terminal. Okay. So that's neural damage and you get fibrotic changes um, within the smooth muscle wall of the vascular, you know, chert as well. So fibrosis, smooth muscle changes, inflammation, all affecting this nitric oxide. So radiation has several components that are affected, even though the prostate stays in place, we're not manipulating or moving any nerves. We're not affecting any large, um, large vessels in terms of surgery. Okay. Um, radiation causes erectile dysfunction, again, late side effects. And typically within about five years, 50% of patients will report erectile dysfunction. So a lot of men initially with radiation therapy for prostate cancer treatment will say, my erections are good. I'm not having any problems, but by virtue of radiation, you get these cumulative effects such that about about five years, 50% of men will report erectile dysfunction. Again, you get arterial damage, and you can also have um, damage to your internal um, pudendal, all right, internal pudendal artery there. The cavernosal nerve, okay, so radiation therapy can reduce motor function by affecting the cavernosal nerve as well. So it's not just the area of the prostate, but you've got to think about what's around the prostate. Again, these cavernosal nerves. So your prostate's here, cavernosal nerves. And then while the prostate is not here, your internal pudendal artery, your prostate would be in this area here. So all of those structures can be significantly affected. So this is, again, short version of what happens to our you know, 60,000 patients per year. And then we've got about 90 or 100,000 that will uh, undergo a uh, prostatectomy. So uh, typically robotic laparoscopic radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer. So what happens post-surgically? There are a few things. So you can get direct damage to these cavernosal nerves, all right? So when you talk about having a nerve sparing prostatectomy, this is what is done. These nerves are identified on the exterior component of the prostate. Uh, they are inside, the nerves are not incised. The sheath which with the nerves are contained are incised and they're separated off of the capsule of the prostate. So as you can ima imagine, there can be direct damage to these nerves. There also can be what we call neuropraxia, which is damage due to a small amount of ischemia or lack of blood flow to the, this area which can happen um, by virtue of stretch, can be happen by thermal injury. Neuropraxia can be thermal injury to the myelin or the nice sheet that coats the nerve and it allows for um, good nerve, um, uh, good good nerve communication, excuse me, that's what I'm looking for, to and from the penis for erection. And then again, there can be vascular damage in the area of the pudendal artery. So what happens though with this, loss of innervation, all right? So you can get inability of your smooth muscle within the corporal body to relax. And then what happens? That smooth muscle within the central portion of the penis I highlighted before is less compliant. It's not, you know, it's not as easily dilating or, you know, contracting in the flaccid state, but really dilating. It's not getting as much expansion as it would. And that ha then we get this venous leak because the two arteries aren't abutting. They're only getting to, let's say, 80% or 90% because you're getting remodeling within this smooth muscle, even just from nerve damage. So there are a lot of components there. Um, and it's not just the nerves itself that can affect communication, but it's how the nerves can then downstream affect smooth muscle um, within the penis. So recovery of, of erectile dysfunction is reported to take up to four years. I mean, that's ridiculous. I would never, I mean, quoting this information, but I would never tell a patient, 
oh, you've got to wait four years before we're going to do anything for your erectile function. All right. There are a lot of um, centers that are doing um, penile rehab. I'll talk about that briefly on the next slide. But I get asked this all the time. This is a reported range of erectile dysfunction post radical prostatectomy. 14 to 90%. That's insane. How can you have a number that's so wide? Well, some of the reasons we have different, different study populations, difference in data collection, reporting biases. You, you know, you send out a survey and you only have, you know, 40 out of your 100 patients that respond. So you really get a reporting bias, bias skill, whether you have, you know, nerve sparing tissue. Um, and again, what their preoperative function was is very important. Retropubic prostatectomy, similar, similar rates, along with laparoscopic radical pro prostatectomy. Again, ranges are so wide, and it, these are typically reported at, at 12 months time frame. So it there are a lot of patients who I've spoken to, you know, who I'm not doing the surgery, but they'll come to see me and they'll say, you know, that no one told me that I was going to have erectile dysfunction post-procedure. And that's really challenging to hear because. The data is out there. Um, doesn't mean everyone's going to be that 90% who has significant erectile dysfunction, um, but the data really points to the fact that you know there's more erectile dysfunction than not, and I think expectations should be set going into any sort of treatment, whether it's radiation or prostatectomy, about sexual um, sexual side effects. So, what are some centers doing? We'll start to kind of get into treatment of erectile dysfunction in this setting. Some centers are implementing what's called penile rehab. Now, there's some uh, conflicting data. Early data out of Europe about five, six years ago did not show any benefit for penile rehab. What is penile rehab? It is trying to increase blood flow and potentially prevent fibrosis of the penis. How is that done? Typically with a daily um, PD-5 inhibitor, so uh, you know a, a daily Cialis, um, or low dose sildenafil sometimes can be used in conjunction most often with a vacuum erection device or, or a stretch device. Some centers have implemented additionally using um, injectables. We'll talk about that in a second for this penile rehab. Um, so there are, there's not a standard protocol, but the thought process is, can we increase blood flow? Can we limit potentially developing uh, development of fibrosis in the corporal tissue, which will subsequently improve erections later on? Um, the most recent meta-analysis that um, was done in 2022 did show a positive response to um, penile rehab. So I think that's something that we'll see more, uh, more talked about in the preoperative um, or pre-procedure setting um, as as things kind of continue to develop in, in terms of research there. So under, oh my God, thank God, Kevin Bacon, I have to breathe. So um, other things about me, the toilet paper roll, I like it when it goes over. Um, I have a thing about cloth napkins. We use cloth napkins all of the time. I do see a lot of therapists, but I also use a Peloton frequently. My favorite food is hamburgers, no cheese. My favorite color is green. I mean, I don't think that that's wildly not obvious. Um, and I'm always cold. I literally am always, I'm always cold. And while I'm not looking forward to menopause and I will prevent that from a hormone, hormonal standpoint, I can take a hot flash every now and then. So, okay. Treatment options. So PD-5 inhibitors, why do I bring this up? All right. This is a, a small piece of information, but one it allows you to understand why you take, you know, certain ones in, in one way and others in another way. And it allows you to understand, gosh, I've tried two or, you know, two out of the four. Am I, what are my expectations? I'm all about expectations for outcomes if I tried number three and number four, all right? They all work in a very similar fashion, okay? Um, what they're doing is they're trying to promote back to my, um, other slide that I have uh, that I bypassed quickly. Um, they're trying to promote um, continued CGMP within the cell um, such that the smooth muscle will stay dilated and you will have you know continual continued blood flow and, and sustained erection. But they are a little bit different. So Viagra, the first one out in the market, um, typically dosed in 50 or 100 milligrams. Onset is, uh, is about 30 minutes. This is one we see that has the most associated headache, flushing, and potential for visual um, disturbances because of a slight receptor, um, subreceptor affinity. You've got Levitra in certain instances avoided in cardiac 
um, with cardiac conditions to Dalithil, which is our Cialis. The onset is about 20 minutes, but has the longest duration. So this is the one that you can use daily. It's the most common in penile rehab. Does have benefit when even though you don't have a prostate, but has a benefit just in general knowledge of um, improving um, lower urinary tract symptoms. And then uh, Stendra, which is the newest one on the market, a little less side effects, less of, less of effect with food. So they are different. Obviously, they can be marketed in, um, under different names, but overall, they're working in the same way. They're all PD-5 inhibitors. This is a nice um, little slide to show the comparison between the two. Again, you have the standout here of Tadalafil with a longer duration. Um, it can be dosed for da daily dosing. It's the only one that's approved with daily dosing. And, uh, you know, just compares a bit of a side effect profile. I would say dyspepsia or GERD is the most common side effect that I see with, um, with Cialis, even in the daily doses. So what are our contraindications? This is what I talked about before, nitrate containing medications. All right. So this is where nitric oxide is important to know what it does. It's going to increase, or excuse me, increase the lower blood pressure. So we can't use it in that situation. Some of the, again, main side effects, um, GERD, headache, flushing. Um, there's a very rare condition um, of optic neuropathy can, that can happen with PD-5 usage. And then other components that you want to think about. So if this is your primary mode of treatment or you're put on penile rehab, you want to know what your potential side effects are. You don't want to think you're having, you know, um, a migraine or a heart attack because of, you know, some uh, Cialis usage. You want to know that it can be affected by a fatty meal, all right? Um, and then uh, other concerns are, are a little less applicable to us. So I love this one also. So one of the things I usually say to men is, all right, I'm going to put you on daily Cialis, but I'm also going to tell you to use Viagra or Cialis at the highest dose when you want to have an erection for masturbation, penetrative intercourse, et cetera. And the question I always get is like, am I going to die? You know, how much is too much? So you've got to think about, where these medications came from. And the primary indication for these medications was for a condition called pulmonary hypertension. And the treatment for pulmonary hypertension for men and women, um, this is sildenafil. So let's call it, you know, so, yeah, Viagra. 80 milligrams, upwards of 80 milligrams, three times a day, okay? So when I tell you to take your five milligrams of, of you know, Cialis every day and add on to that, 100 milligrams, you know, once a week, twice a week, three times a week for on-demand dosage. This is where I feel safe and comfortable telling you to do this, okay? Because you got to know where the medication is coming from. So that's a quick and dirty on the oral medication. You want to know why they're different in terms of side effects. And you also want to know, you know, what, where is safety, okay? It's good to be able to have some gray areas, but you also, also want to make sure you're safe. So this is a nice way to know that you're safe. All right, vacuum erection devices. Lots of doctors like to say, yes, use this. And this can be great and potentially more utilized in the rehab setting, penile rehab setting to stretch the penis, limit potential fibrosis. If you look at the success rates, it's actually quite high. You're talking about 70% um, satisfaction rates for some of these studies. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever used these. Like I disclosed earlier, I do not have a penis, so I've not used it, but they are challenging to use. The biggest you know, problem that I see is, is patients have significantly, significant, excuse me, difficulty getting the device in the right place, generating the appropriate force, and they get frustrated. Now, one of the other really important components to a vacuum device is you need to have a pressure limit, all right? Without a pressure limit, you're going to have a potential of causing more damage. So while there's, you know, no systemic side effects, you're not going to have a headache, you're not going to have indigestion, um, you can get some pain and bruising with, you know, with the device, and you can get actual damage to the vasculature of the corporal tissue if you exceed um, the pressure limit. And again, it can be really challenging to use just from a dexterity standpoint and um, a body habit standpoint. So I put that out there. Interurethral suppositories, I use these very little, all right? Um, Alprostadil, it's a prostaglandin. It gets inserted into the penis. It works on CAMP. So CAMP here, RCGMP is what we see our PD-5 inhibitors work on. Again, all leads to smooth muscle relaxation, increased blood flow for an erection. What does this look like? 
Um, it's a little device. The pellet is about the size of a grain of rice. This whole component goes in through the urethra until it can't, you know, put it in until it stops. You eject the little pellet and it absorbs through the urethra into the corporal tissue. It takes anywhere from about, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. And erection usually lasts, I'll tell you in practice, probably 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it can contribute to strictures. It is painful with absorption of the medication. And I'm going to tell you on our board exam, the question about side effects of intraurethral suppositories is the majority of the time they don't work. So again, I throw that out there. It doesn't mean that it's not worth trying, but if you're going to look for the most effective route for an erection, post-prostatectomy, this is probably not your best bet. So what is, so intercaval genesis injections, the fancy, you know, fancy name for trimix, bimix, quad, quad mix. It is important to know what you're sticking into your penis if you're going to put a needle into your penis, okay? These injections are wildly effective, but they can carry side effects. And in some instances, guys will say, gosh, I, I got an erection, but it was so strong that the sensation changes, all right? So it's like overfilling something. And that's important to know. It's important to share with your provider because these medications can be altered in terms of concentration or percentage um, within the injection. So Alprostadil, this is the one that's also in the interurethral suppository. This is important to know because this is the one that typically, and I'll, I have this on another slide, typically causes the most pain, all right? Um, and can be a, a pain being like you put the, inject the medication in and it feels like, oh my God, my penis is burning. This is that one. Um, it is the only FDA approved agent for, for erectile dysfunction. Okay. Um, it's a single agent. So as marketed as a single agent, it's edex. It's great for travel because otherwise the bimix, quadmix, trimix needs to be refrigerated. So this is one that's commonly used, um, is expensive as you can imagine. Papaverin, um, again, works to, for smooth muscle relaxation at the same level of cyclic AMP. <clears throat> Ventolamine is an alpha, alpha blocker. It increases um, norepinephrine. And then atropine, which is another, um, another medication that works at an anticholinergic receptor um, and increases intracellular calcium, which if you look back here, we've got our intracellular calcium here that helps to contribute to smooth muscle relaxation. So they all work in different ways. That's why combining them can lead to a, a you know, very potent erection. We're delivering the medication directly into the corporal body. So we're limiting systemic side effects. So for guys who are on nitrates or something like that, um, this can be super helpful. Um, but they're not without side effects, as you can imagine. Pain, injury of scar tissue to the penis if you're injecting it the same place over and over and over again. Um, you could get some curvature there. You can get a hematoma, a little bit of bleeding, swelling, et cetera. Obviously pain associated with um, injection. Now, this one I very briefly um, putting out there is the penile prosthesis. If you're at a space where you failed oral medications, you failed injections, um, you know, you've failed some other endeavors, this is something that can be, um, you know, it, it can be surgically performed. It is a foreign body, so it carries that risk with it, but overall satisfaction rates are up towards of about 80% in men who decide to go through with the surgery. So it is a good option. Um, there are a few different varieties. One that's a malleable, that can be good for men that don't have a lot of manual dexterity. The other um, more traditional option, which is the three-piece inflatable prosthesis, you have a small reservoir within the pelvis and additional um, pump within the scrotum, which allows you to inflate these cylinders within the penis um, with water. Um, they're tip they have been traditionally covered by Medicare. There's been some insurance changes in the last year, so I don't have that updated data, um, but traditionally they have been covered, so they've been an option for a lot of men in the U.S. They have not been covered um, outside of the U.S., so our data is um, more uh, is limited in terms of um, global usage. Now, something that's on the horizon and I think is super exciting. Oh my gosh, Kevin Bacon, thank God. I, you can tell I don't even know when these are coming in. Um, so me, I sleep very little. I drive a black car, like I think 75% of the world. I, I am a huge sports fan. So I love college football. I went to Notre Dame. Um, so yes, I'm stuck with that. 
I love college basketball. One of my roommates from college um, lives in Chapel Hill. So we are UNC fans. And I have this strange, bizarre love for women's college softball. I could watch that all day, every day. And I typically do the months of May and June. So no judgment. Okay. But this, this therapy or technology, I am a huge fan of. Um, I use it in other areas of my practice, but it has um, its origin for urology in treatment of erectile dysfunction. So low intensity shockwave therapy, it's been used for several decades. And what does it do? Okay. So shockwaves are acoustic waves um, that deliver this high intensity focused energy. Um, in the past, we used this it was same form of shockwave in, well, not low intensity, but high intensity to break up kidney stones. And someone said, this is great technology, but let's try to change it in, from a high intensity to a low intensity and see what it does for certain tissues. So um, thankfully, someone much smarter than I took this shockwave, this acoustic wave, and said, we are going to apply it to other tissues, all right? And what does it do, all right? The short version is it induces microtrauma. So it induces microtrauma and triggers this cascade of events. It recruits endothelial cells. It works at promoting angiogenic factors. It induces neovascularization, enhances blood flow, and decreases demyelinated nerves, all right? These are all things we've talked about that are important interactions. So nerve conduction, blood flow. This is all blood flow here, all right? Primary um, benefit for erectile function. So this technology... Um, while not FDA approved, which is really not wonderful, but we're working on that. I love the FDA and it's down, you know, it's 45 minutes from my house, but as like, like, you know, it takes a long time to get um, new technology approved. This technology is approved for plantar fasciitis. So if you think about what that is, it's fibrosis or typically scar tissue on the, you know, on the lower side of your foot shockwave there breaks up that fibrosis and it call it causes all these additional additional components recruitment of you know new blood cells um decreased number of demyelinated cells demyelinated nerve fibers don't carry um nerve conduction well and are typically more associated with pain so if you take that technology and you fast forward and say well how can we apply that to other areas of the body specifically the penis and erections um, you know, you get get fibrosis that we talked about. This is why I think the the understanding of the pathology of erection is important. You know, we talked about how changes in you know nerves during prostatectomy or during radiation can cause fibrosis within the smooth muscle fibers of the corporal body. So again, think about our penile anatomy. That same fibrosis, you know, is the same fibrosis in a little bit of a different form as that you see with plantar fasciitis. So why shouldn't something like this work to break up that fibrosis and then recruit new cells to improve blood flow to that area? Um, it is not regenerative, okay? But you've got to remember, it recruits stem cells in the same way that I cut my finger, you know, four weeks ago and the, the skin has healed, all right? Those are the cells that it's recruiting. You're not going to grow, you know, extra corporal tissue, but it's really trying to repair what we have existing. So this technology um, has studies um, show good safety and efficacy in patients who are suffering with erectile dysfunction. I think this is going to be more utilized um, in the post prostatectomy you know, radiation or surgery patient. It is different. I caution you here. It is different than it, all shockwaves are, are, excuse me all wave treatments are not the same. All right. So there are, I'm not here to disparage any other area, but I want to feel like you leave here educated about what is out there. So this low intensity shockwave therapy is what, what we use in our practice and is as what I would recommend to a patient if they felt like this was something they wanted to pursue for erectile dysfunction is an acoustic sound wave. It is different than what you may see marketed as a gains wave or radio or ultrasound wave, all right? And that, that will contribute to, you know, what is able to be achieved because they're different waves, okay? So shock waves and sound waves different. Um, and because they differ, you have um, different effects, right? You can have, a, you need to have this faster speed. You need to have, you know, more amplitude um, to get the effect that you need at the tissue level and to penetrate appropriately. So not all therapies are the same. 
And you want to be mindful that you're doing the appropriate research. If you decide this is something you're going to spend your money on because it's not FDA approved, it's all out of pocket cost. So this is a great slide and it shows the different areas that the shockwave, I'm not just, you know, snake oiling you here. This is a great article from 2017 about shockwave in erectile dysfunction and nice meta-analysis. But in more recently in the literature, there have been articles about, this is, these two are within this last year, about shockwave treatment for claudication, which is um, peripheral vascular disease. This one was out a few months ago, again, shockwave therapy that cardiac surgeons are using um, to prevent ischemic, uh, additional ischemia during surgery. So while, yes, I'm talking about it in the realm of erectile dysfunction, um, to reinforce the validity of it, I, I highlight these articles that have come out recently because I think you'll be seeing more of them as time goes on. One of the things that is not experimental and can be great is pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, again, I talked about this before, you've got these two important muscle groups, your ischial cavernosis and your bulbal cavernosis that do contribute to um, promoting a more rigid erection towards you know, the end of erections. Um, so again, it's important to see a pelvic floor physical therapist. They, cannot, they can help not only with you know, urinary um, side effects from from treatment, specifically more surgical, but they also can help with, with erections. And that's why it can help increase this skeletal muscle. Now, one of the other components that I wanted to highlight here, which is one of the questions I, you know, sometimes get asked. So first, this is again, pelvic floor musculature. This is a wonderful photo. This a prostate here, your bladder here, Men have two sphincters or two muscular groups that help control um, continence or urination. One here at the bladder neck and then the primary one at um, this external sphincter here. When the prostate is removed, I have this in the next slide, what happens is this sphincter gets reattached up here, okay? Um, and we'll talk about the implications of that, but you've got the levator muscles that are laterally. And then this is a nice way of looking at where the placement is of these ischial cavernosis and then your bulbo cavernosis muscles. Well, so something that we may not talk about, but patients will come in and say, you know, class, Hey, I'm ejaculating urine. Why is that? Okay. Um, and again, this is not you know, erection related necessarily, but it is a, you know, sexual side effect, of, you know, more specifically of prostate surgery. And the reason that happens is with removal of the prostate, this bladder neck, okay, is, is one more open, okay? And what happens during normal orgasm is you get contracture, significant contracture of this bladder neck, so that the ejaculate, which would typically come out here, doesn't go into the bladder. It's gonna to go to the path of least resistance. So this is closest. If this is open, this, the ejaculate is gonna go into the bladder. Now, again, in normal orgasm, this will close and constrict tightly and this stays open so that the ejaculate comes out the tip of the penis. But in the setting of prostate surgery, this, this muscle group can you know, be weak in such that it's not closing off as tightly and so then what happens is you actually get urine that comes out during uh, ejaculation or orgasm. So while I'm not fixing that for you, at least that can be an explanation or something you can talk about. It's, you know, it's sometimes difficult to say, gosh, I'm peeing, you know, into my wife. Is that causing a problem? No, it's not causing a problem. Nothing bad is happening to her. Nothing bad's happening to you. But this is the, this is the reason that it's happening is you're not getting that significant, you know, closure, that tight constriction at the bladder neck. All right, so I am winding down, I promise. Um, but I do think this merits attention. So I, at the very beginning, I talked about the components vascular, um, you know, neural, psychological, and then hormonal. All right. There had there was a, a new study out this year, the traverse trial um, in men who these men did not have prostate cancer, but it showed that there was not an increased risk of testosterone or excuse me, of prostate cancer with testosterone therapy. So that's wonderful. Now, we've always thought, you know, testosterone has a, you know, a role in prostate cancer. Thankfully, that has, that
that's being challenged in, you know, in a good way. Um, we do know that testosterone has a role in erectile function. How do we know that? So decreases in testosterone occur with aging as do, and conversely, the prevalence of uh, erectile dysfunction increases with aging. So inversely proportional. Castration usually cause, causes erectile dysfunction. I'll be honest, I've, I've never had a patient um, you know, surgically or medical, medically castrated who is still able to um, have good erections. And then typically sexual function improves or returns to normal when castrated men, again, this is a lot of the times referring to medically, um, have treatment or surgically, you know, undergo treatment for testosterone replacement or are removed from whatever medication that they're on and their erections will improve. One of the other added points, hypogonadism, um, you know, is is still debatable the level at what point you might get erectile dysfunction. Um, so again, I, that is not concrete data. But so we talked about safety of testosterone replacement in patients who have been previously treated for prostate cancer, either with prostatectomy or radiotherapy is out there. All right. So that is wonderful. We, there's even some evidence to suggest that very low levels of testosterone may lead to worse cancer or oncologic outcomes. Um, there will be oncologists who will argue with me, but I think the tide is shifting towards the appropriate patient um, potentially receiving testosterone replacement for erectile function and other quality of life um, aspects of prostate cancer, or excuse me, other quality of life aspects um, that can be associated with um, hypogonadism. So this I'd like to, I put in here to really show the importance. Um, this is a 2021, you know, study. Testosterone replacement therapy should be offered to select patients who have a history of definitively treated prostate cancer, adequately, you know, designed trials are necessary to confirm this, but this is, you know, something that is, I think, on the horizon for potential benefit of you know, hypogonadism effects, but primarily, you know, associated with erectile function post prostatectomy does not mean you can't, you can't have that. All right. Last Kevin Bacon. I love puzzles. I learned to ski as an adult. Um, I cannot sing even a little, you probably can tell that from my voice. Oh, I am amazing at bagging groceries. Literally it's my favorite thing to do. And I wonder, uh, wonderful. My favorite vacation should should have said that has been to the Galapagos. It's a wonderful place if you've ever been or have the chance of going. Okay, last component. Um, while I treat brains, I tend to treat the small brain and not the big brain, but there is a huge psychology of erectile dysfunction. I could speak an hour on this and I apologize that this is the you know two slide version of my talk, um, but it is so important to address the psychological aspects of um, post-prostatectomy treatment and how a decline in erectile dysfunction as precipitous as it can be with surgery or you know a slow accumulation post-radiation can affect um, a man's health. Um, again, this is the a medicine analysis that I quote about depression, um, pre and post prostate cancer treatment, um, different age, you know, excuse me, different ranges of it, but significant, you know, almost 20% of men with some, with either before, during, or after um, treatment um, with new onset depression, uh, depression, excuse me, associated with that. We always recommend sex therapy either alone or partnered if possible. And it's wildly important to address you know, the specific components of, you know, cancer-related grief and challenges of the grief related to, I, I, I say that in all sincerity, grief related to um, loss of erections. So that is my big stop. Um, I promise no more Kevin Bacon, but I appreciate you all listening to me. And I will happily try to answer any of your questions. Yeah, Neil? Uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask yes. directly? Oh, I, Neil, could, okay. could I make a comment, please? Hi, Would you please? Uh, this, class, this is Dr. Metzger. How are you? you wonderful talk. Just absolutely a graduate course in, in sexual dysfunction after prostate issues. Um, in fact, I'm sitting here smoking a cigarette. It was so complete. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. I'll that's take okay. that. Yeah, well, the, just uh, when I was in practice, we weren't doing um, 
we weren't doing robotics yet. It just started. But do you think the robotics have changed the ED after surgery? Because the surgeon sort of, sort of think it has. But Correct. So if you look at the reported rates, and this is where it comes, if you look at specific meta, uh, excuse me, specific studies, the reported incidence of erectile dysfunction is lower with robotic laparoscopic procedures. Um, but because that that range is still so wide, they don't always have like a, a rung to hang their hat on, okay? Because if you look at the composite literature, it's still going to give you this about 20 to 70% range, whether you're talking about ra open radical prostatectomy or um, robotic laparoscopic prostatectomy. The range is still very wide. That being said, there are several studies that they can quote, and typically they're their own, but you've got to remember, and I'm not trying to um, minimize the work that they do, and I do think that the, it, the robot is advantageous for trying to minimize nerve damage and vascular damage during the procedure, um, but you get a lot of reporting biases in these major centers because you have patients that aren't coming back for follow-up. They're going back to their local person. They've been sent this survey. They're not responding. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you a very wishy-washy answer. I do think there is improvement with the robotic laparoscopic. I don't think it's as much as they would like you to believe. And we, we had uh, a great deal of success with the vacuum devices um, in, in non-surgical, non-radiation, non-prostate cancer patients. Not very much success with the cancer patients. The shots seemed to, to be the thing that worked. And the old-fashioned trimix, um, when, when properly placed, it, it, it really uh, it helped off a lot of people. We, uh, you know, we used that a lot. There was a guy in San Diego, I don't remember his name, but he he really championed it early on maybe 10 15 years ago and that was uh and he also the incontinence rate you have you're too young to remember but some of the older studies they they called the continence if you just use one pad a day well if, if you use that's, one pad so a day still, you're that's wet still, and, that's still the um that's still the standard of um of dry in po in post prostatectomy patients one sure. pad per day and it, and you know, most of us aren't walking around with one pad or we're not walking around with any pad. So I think sometimes they're a little disingenuous. The, as you know, the British study showed the active surveillance men, there was only a 5% difference between surgical patients and active surveillance patients. Um, yep. And that, that I believe because it's an older population, myself included, um, yeah. Great talk. Thank you so much. You're just Thank you well, for well done. Thank you, Dr. Kloss. I have to con concur. A fabulous talk. Thank you so much. And it's going to help men all over the world and, and their partners. Okay. okay. It's a medication question about how essentially how much Tadalafil that one can take. Um, and then a second question about pelvic floor physical therapy. So um, I'm going to answer the question the way the way I would um, counsel a patient. So this patient was on five milligrams of Cialis every day. Love that. It's Cialis, it's the longer acting one. Um, primary care or some another provider increased that daily dose to 10 milligrams, okay? Um, you still, all right, can take an additional amount on that, all right? So when you think about that pulmonary hypertension, what's the safety? These patients are taking potentially you know, um, you know, 124 milligrams of a P5 inhibitor every day for a period of time, all right? Um, that being said, I think you get to a point where what is, how much is efficacious, all right? And so the, the data that we have now really is focusing on what's FDA approved. So five milligrams of Tadalafil in addition to either the 20 milligrams or 100 milligrams of, um, so 20 milligrams of additional Tadalafil or 100 milligrams of Sidenafil on top of that, okay? So, I mean, I, I think you can do either of those. I think you could take another, you know, 10 or 20 milligrams of Tadalafil or max dose of um, Sildenafil. And what you're going to have to weigh out is, are you getting any benefit from that, all right? My, 
my suspicion is probably not as much as you would want. And then side effect profile wise, because you'll likely see with the, you know, increasing dose, the increasing rate of side effects, you know, your headache, you get more headaches, you get more flushing, the GERD, some of the myalgia is associated with um, Cialis. So you can definitely try um, an on-demand dosing on top of your 10, 10 milligrams, but I'm not certain that you're going to see the efficacy that you want. Again, that's just knowing you know, a broad generalization. Um, in terms of pelvic floor physical therapy, so pelvic floor physical therapy can definitely help um, even patients post-radiation. Yes, primarily we see the benefit from a post-surgical because we're looking at, you know, working on skeletal muscle strength, working on, you know, strength of available cavernosis, issue cavernosis, but again, definitely going to be helped with radiation. In side effects from radiation, you can still, you know, get the neural changes, the fibrosis of the, um, of the penis and anything that you can do to try to recruit more, so contracture of some of those muscle groups, whether it's bulbal cavernosis, ischial cavernosis, some of the levator muscles, um, to augment blood flow into the penis can be helpful. So it's not just limited to the surgical patient. Is it probably most effective um, for the surgical patient? Yes, and that just has to do with you know the mechanism of action of treatment, but I would not I would still say if you had radiation and you're having, you know, erectile dysfunction, and you want to go to someone who's, you know, knows what they're doing, um, and or potential urinary symptoms because you can work on sphincter, uh, sphincter control as well. All right. Um, is it ED if you have zero libido after 24 months of ADT and can't get an erection? Oh, great question. So this is speaks to this hormonal component I was referring to. So your, so. Um, ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, all right? That means essentially we are causing your testosterone to be zero. So in this, um, you know, in this aspect of things, um, what, we're, what we're doing is we're creating a hypogonadal state. This is here, castration, which is what ADT does, usually causes erectile dysfunction. Now, what castration also does is it affects, affects your brain. Okay, so we know that testosterone can penetrate the blood brain barrier. Testosterone, this is, sorry, I can like go on a real rabbit hole here, but testosterone is one of the main mediators of increasing dopamine centrally in your brain. Okay, dopamine is a main driver for desire to arousal and orgasm. So libido is significantly affected for take the erections out of this by a decline in testosterone secondary to the cerebral or, or, or brain effects. Okay. So this is what we talk about. Usually when castration, um, so castration, so testosterone levels return to normal, you'll improve your libido. All right. And there's a good chance your erections will improve as well. So it's a little bit of a layered question in that, um, the mechanism of action from a neuro or a vascular standpoint is not directly affected by testosterone, but we know based on, you know, ancillary data that low levels of testosterone do affect erectile dysfunction. Hope that was good. Oh, penal implants. All right. Um, so I don't do penal implants, but, um, they were what was done for anyone with erectile dysfunction pre-Viagra, all right? So pre-Pfizer, Viagra, everyone with erectile dysfunction, you know, not everyone, but vast majority was covered by insurance, um, would get a, a penile prosthesis. They are great in the right patient. I will have to say, again, the satisfaction rates are about 80%, sometimes a little bit higher for the implantable penile prosthesis. And these are guys who are motivated because they failed everything else. Um, and they're willing to undergo a surgery that is putting a foreign body into, you know, into them, which carries a risk of infection and erosion. Um, you know, it can be mechanically slightly challenging to use. But I think in the, if you have failed the, the oral medication, you failed injections, it is 1000% and you want to be sexually active, a great option, a great option. Else. Well, thank you, doctor. Is there anybody else that has any questions tonight? I, I think that I'll just add that um, if if I wanted to to do a thorough workup 
on my erection uh, dysfunction, I'd have a complete list of every medication I'm taking, both prescription and over the counter, all the supplements I'm taking, and I would be sure to bring it in to whoever is treating me for that. Uh, because so much of, of what it is that aggravates uh, erectile dysfunction is medication, just general. Sure. Um, okay, Brian has posted that you're, we're, we're going to have, uh, we have two more questions here. One here from Murad, will regular use of a vacuum, would vacuum pumps help an ED? Okay, so that is a great question. Um, I don't have a straightforward answer for you is the short version, okay? Um, I have patients who do use um, who do use a vacuum pump on a protocol that is not, you know, not part of our typical treatment or recommendations for prevention of erectile dysfunction, who do use a vacuum regular vacuum device. Um, with that, with that trying to be the end point. Okay. So when you break it down, you want to think about what the vacuum device does. It pulls blood into the penis and it also tries to improve, um, the pliability of the penis for prevention, potentially of fibrosis. Um, I don't think there's enough data. I mean, there's not enough data out there, period, to know whether or not it's going to be helpful. And you've got to think, you know, there are the more common causes of fibrosis are likely not going to be impacted by the stretch of the vacuum device, okay? Yes, you can expand the blood flow, but you still may be getting the pathology that's developing within the smooth muscle um, of the corporal tissue um, that's not going to be impacted by just that stretch. Now, you're gonna, you're gonna throw back to me and say, but, didn't you say that shockwave is helping to break up potential fibrosis within the corporal tissue? And yes, I did. But what it's also doing is it's also trying to recruit, um, you know, factors to that area that will help promote restoration of, you know, better tissue. Okay. And we don't have that data from the, from the vacuum pump. We know what it does, but we don't have anything on a cellular level that, that would lead us to say, yeah, that's, yes, that's going to help you know, longer term. So I don't have the data to support that being helpful for prevention. Um, I do, I, I am a fan of, I think if you, you increase blood flow to the area, that, that's likely going to be helpful long term. I think everyone over 40 should be on daily Cialis, men and women alike. Um, so, you know, it could be, I could be singing a different tune in five years, but that, you know, you're still going to have the mechanical processes going on or, or more molecular processes, excuse me, um, at the level of the corporal tissue, even when you're doing, you know, a vacuum device, and at least with a shockwave, while you're trying to attack the fibrosis, you also are inducing this different cellular response. Helpful. Well, we also have a question here from Dean about something called L-citrulline. Okay. Um, so, all right. You guys are really testing me tonight. Um, I know probably very little about this other than I do have a lot of patients who take a lot, a lot of supplements. Um, I know it's a, it's an amino acid. It is, um, metabolized or broken down within the kidney and there's some very loose data, loose, um, to show an association of increases in testosterone with l sertraline So that is all I know. I'm not going to overpromise anything other than that. Um, I love a supplement, you know, if, if it works great, that the, the studies that I'm aware of that help with, um, supplements that do help with testosterone, you know, again, it, small levels are this Tonga Ali and Fenugreek, F-E-N-G-U-R-I, I believe it is. Um, those two do have some data out there to support them from a supplement and testosterone standpoint, um, but I'm not as familiar with l sertraline I know, again, there is some loose data to show potential increases in testosterone. But if you know more, please educate me. I'm always happy to learn. Excellent. Does anybody else have questions this evening? I just want to remind you folks viewing on YouTube that 
There's a world of information on the Prostate Forum website at www.prostateforum.org. That's prostateforum.org. Uh, there is a link there so that you can uh, enter your email and we will send you uh, emails about our meetings, our support group meetings and future presentations like the one you see. If all you're doing is following us on YouTube, you're missing a lot from Prostate Forum. Be sure to check out our website. Be sure to, to enter your email. Uh, we have support group meetings from 5 to 7 p.m. on the second and fourth Tuesday uh, of every month, including December. They're two-hour groups with Dr. Metzger, with Ira, where you can discuss your experiences and perhaps discuss where you need guidance. We also have presentations somewhere around 11 times a year. Um, with that, if there are no other questions, and I don't see any, Doctor, I want to thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you right. again. I really, I really appreciate your time. I hope you guys have a great evening, and uh, I'm happy to come back at any time. We look forward to it. Thank you.